Today we're going to be taking a look inside the GM LS engine to see what's inside and how it works. We're also going to take a look at what makes this engine so strong and so popular that everyone's swapping these into any chassis that you can think of. We're also going to look at some of the problem areas on these LS engines so you know what to look for when you're looking to buy one. Now this particular engine is out of a Silverado truck which means that it's got an iron block with aluminum heads and this plastic intake manifold. Now taking a look around the front of the engine here we have a bunch of cooling hoses that go to this aluminum piece here which houses the water pump. At the top here we have the throttle body. This one uses drive-by wire. Now coming across the front here we do have an old-style mechanical fan with a clutch system and all of our accessory belts would have bolted up in front of here. We've got the power steering pump at the bottom here. Now from the back here we can see the rather tall plastic air intake manifold. We've got our fuel rail located inside of here and the exhaust headers at the bottom here. Now the first thing we're going to do is get this clutch out of the way here. And remove that. I guess these engines come with this extra cable that you can plug into the wall and charge it up so you can get more horsepower. Next we'll take care of the rest of the cooling system. We've got our upper and lower radiator hoses with the thermostat here as well as the two lines that go out to the heater core. There's the thermostat. Those are some long bolts. And we'll just pop that off the block there. Next I'm going to remove this power steering pump assembly. This is quite a chunky power steering pump and bracket here. Ooh, it's heavy. I feel like GM wasted a lot of material by putting this whole big bracket in on top of the block. Now you can see with the accessories off that it definitely cleans up a lot of space in the front of the engine here. We've got coolant jackets that go into the block over here and we've got the crank pulley over here where you can see it's got two pulleys. One for the AC and one for the alternator and power steering pump. Next we're going to work to remove this plastic air intake from the heads here. These are all just 8mm bolts that I need to remove. So taking a look here, this is a port injected engine only, so you've got your four port injectors for this side and another four on the other side with the fuel rail located over here. This uses a manifold absolute pressure sensor. Check out this other ventilation line, how clogged up it is. I wonder what the rest of the engine looks like inside. Alright, now I'm going to remove this air intake. Now with the air intake removed, you can see you've got this nice flat plane here where these two knock sensors sit with some really sketchy wiring. You can see the heads here are 90 degrees apart and that's because this is a V8, which is going to give it better balance. We've also got these ports here for the intake which are nice and tall but rather skinny but that's because it only feeds one valve per cylinder. Check out how much sludge and carbon buildup there is on this air intake port inside of here. This is actually pretty bad especially for a port injected engine and if you look down inside of here you can see there's actually ice in the air intake. I don't have high hopes for the inside of this valve cover. Here I'll just pull off that valve cover. Boy that is really dirty. Check out all the crap and sludge inside of this engine. This is not good for the engine because it's going to prevent oil from reaching the correct spots lubricating it and just clog everything up. Now looking at the cylinder head design for this piston here there's two valves per cylinder. You've got an exhaust valve there that's going to flow over to the exhaust manifold and the intake valve that's going to get its air from the port over here. Now these valves sit side by side to each other as opposed to top and bottom like in a regular overhead cam design. Now further inside of there you can probably make out the push rod and that's going to push this rocker arm assembly through this pivot point up and down which is going to push this valve up and down according to the motion of that push rod which is controlled by a camshaft buried down in the V of the engine. Now by having a single camshaft that powers all eight cylinders and each of their valves you can actually save a lot of space by not having a camshaft sitting on top of the engine over here because everything's just buried inside of there and that's what makes this engine so compact. Now, in addition to where the valves are you can see the spark plugs sit off to the side here in the cylinder head as opposed to down in the middle like a lot of conventional engines. Now I'm going to remove this exhaust manifold. I wonder how many of these studs are going to break. Remove that manifold. Now most LS engines use a separate coil pack for each cylinder but the coils didn't actually sit on the motor. You have this little small wire that goes to them. Now the head bolts on these LS engines are a little interesting. You've got bolts on the outside here that are 10 millimeter. Then inside of here you've got 15 millimeter and then other 15 millimeters on the back side outside here. The head bolts on the back here are pretty short. Now having these really long head bolts is good because it will allow this engine to hold a lot of power. Now in order to access the head bolts inside of here I need to remove all of these rockers. These just 8 millimeter bolts. <sighs> Once the rockers have been removed I can remove this plate here and that will give me access to these bolts. Inside of here if I pull this out you can see you've got the little push rods here. So that camshaft is going to push up on this and this is what's going to cause the rocker arm to push up. Right now I'm just going to move this head here. Here you can see these push rods just sitting inside of this little cavity here. This piston's got water in it and this one's got ice. I'm going to lift off the cylinder head from this side here. 
Let's remove these rods. Now if I use my wife's little toothbrush, we can check out just how much crud and sludge is inside of these push rod cavities here. Now this iron block is actually shared across the 5.3 and 4.8 liter versions of this engine. Since this one has flat top pistons, it's actually just the 4.8 version. The 5.3 has got a different bottom end as well as different pistons. I can remove this little bucket here. So with the heads off, the next thing I'm going to do is remove this top plate here. Just a bunch of 10 millimeter bolts. Here I can pop off these caps here. Sometimes these can get brittle and kind of lose their seal over time, causing the knock sensors to get wet and fail. I'm going to pull out these knock sensors at 22. That's what they look like, just thread right into the block. And we'll just pop off that cover. And you can see the wells for the knock sensors where they sat. Check out how crusty this engine is. This is just oil that's built up and gelled up and dried up. You can imagine if this gets into the oil galley system, it's just gonna clog the whole thing up. So we're done with disassembling the top half of this engine. I next need to rotate it over. Make some mess. And for this mess, I'm gonna use my brother's old dress shirt here to wipe it up. I've got a piece of his old vest here. Dripping everywhere! Now we got the oil coming out, I'm gonna use my wife's old dress here. Let's try sapping that up. Look at all that mess draining out. And none of this oil came out of the sump. It was all blocked up in there. Now the bottom of this motor, we've got an aluminum oil pan, which I like to see. It prevents them from rusting out. Of course, it's got a fram on it. Look at the rest of the engine. This oil filter is completely clogged up with sludge inside. Next, I'm going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that go around to secure the oil pan. This engine either uses 10 or 15 millimeter bolts, sometimes 13, and that's pretty much it. Nasty. And here's a look inside of the oil pan of this really neglected engine. Check out all the sludge and stuff inside of here. My wife is definitely not going to want her toothbrush back. Here you can see the oil pickup tube and there's sludge gathered around here. Next up I'm going to remove, oh my, it actually came across a non 10 millimeter bolt. It's actually a 13 millimeter bolt that I'm going to remove to get this oil pan baffle off. I'll just pop off this pickup tube here. Could it even get worse? Then I'll remove this oil baffle here. Now if you look at how the crankshaft is laid out, you got the front two pistons that kind of butt up against each other here and share this spot on the crankshaft. Similarly, the other six pistons are paired off. That means you're going to have five main bearings located in the middle here. Now one thing that makes the LS engine very strong is its geometry. Not only is the engine a V configuration, but this bottom part here comes off, so it's actually kind of like a Y configuration. Now having this part come up like this, allows you to cross bolt the main bearings over here. So essentially you've got four bolts that hold this main cap down and then another two bolts over here to increase its strength and thus you can hold a lot more power with this style of bearing. I'm gonna try to get this crank bolt off. This one came off pretty easy. I'm gonna beat off this crank pulley. Next I'm gonna work on removing these pistons. We've got these two 11 millimeter bolts that hold the connecting rod cap on. And I can remove that cap. This bearing doesn't look too bad. Then I can just use my wife's old toothbrush here to push on this piston down and release it from the bottom. And that's what the piston looks like. Now the rear main seal on the LS engine is actually just a bolted on plate. It's got the seal on it. Let's see how sludged up this is. I already removed all the bolts before I mounted this on the engine stand. Now at the front of the engine we have this oil pump assembly which is driven off of the crankshaft. Got the oil pickup tube right over here and then we'll send it right into the oil galleys into the block. There's a bunch of 10 millimeter bolts around here that I'm going to remove. Oh my god, look at the sludge inside of there. This is what happens when you don't change your oil. This is nasty. This stuff is just caked on there and it's flaking off. You can imagine what happens to the oil galleys inside the engine. Now the oil pump itself is bolted onto the block. A bunch of these 10 millimeter bolts that are somewhere underneath all this sludge. And that's the oil pump. Now behind the oil pump we have this timing chain. Surprisingly, I don't see any chain tensioners. Pop off these 10 millimeter bolts and then remove the pulley. And the chain. Kind of looks like a bicycle chain to me. Now there's another couple of 10 millimeter bolts that hold this cap on. And then pull off the cap. And the camshaft should just slide right out. Might be a little tedious as it wants to catch on a few things. Now next up we're going to work on removing this crankshaft. There's a couple of 13 millimeter bolts and nuts at the top here as well as 10 millimeter nuts on the cross bolts. Let's remove these main bearings here. A little bit scored up on the bearing surfaces. Check out how much sludge there is in these bolts. And here's a look at the LS engine's crankshaft. With all the bearings removed, I'm next going to lift it. It's not that heavy. Now with the crankshaft removed, it's very easy to see the camshaft and it's located down inside of the V of the engine as opposed to over top of the valves. Now since this is an iron block motor, there's no way I'm going to be lifting this block off of that engine stand, so i got to use my hoist to move it around. 
So here I've got the entire LS engine disassembled here. I'm just going to wipe the sludge off of my wife's old toothbrush here so we can take a closer look at the individual components. Now we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. We've got the oil pan here which is made of aluminum and it's integral to the Chevy LS's lubrication system because it's got these two oil lines here that feed the oil filter on the back of this housing here. Now this oil filter is pretty much all clogged up and can't really do much because there's just so much crap in this engine but more so check out how much crap is down inside of here. There's just so much sludge built up at the bottom there when I went to drain the engine oil nothing could come out because it was just so blocked up that's why I made a big mess turning the engine over now other than the oil filter we've got a block heater that screws in here to keep the engine oil warm in cold winters now next we're going to take a look at the crankshaft this is one of the stronger points in these LS engines now surprisingly all of these bearing surfaces actually look pretty good despite the condition of this engine now one thing to note here is that it uses a cross plane design in that the two middle cylinders are 180 degrees apart but the two outer cylinders here and here are 90 degrees apart from each other over here. And that's going to help with engine balance and vibration, but it's also going to give you that characteristic V8 rumble when you start your car or your truck. And on the back of the crank we have this wheel here with all these teeth on it. That's going to send signals to the crank position sensor. And then on the front here we've got this gear that'll feed the timing chain. Now because this is a V8 it naturally is balanced in both primary and secondary vibrations, which means that you don't need a counter shaft to counterweight this crankshaft. Now taking a look inside the block itself we've got these five main bearing surfaces. Now the bearings themselves look fine but if you look inside of here there is some evidence of wear could be due to oil starvation. Now there's two different styles of LS blocks. You've got your aluminum and then you've got this iron block which you find more in trucks. Now if you're going for more power it's obviously better to go with the stronger iron block but if you're going to put this in a lighter weight sports car it's probably better to go with the aluminum block. And here's a look inside of the V of the block. You can see we've got these little rollers here that are going to roll along this camshaft and that's going to push the lifters up and down and therefore push the rods up and down. Inside of here is the bearing surface for the camshaft itself. It's just got five bearing surfaces similar to the five main bearing surfaces for the crankshaft. Now if we take a look at the oil circuit we've got the oil pump which is mounted up here and its pickup tube is going to draw in oil over here and then output that into the block here. It'll then send it along this galley along the side of the block up into the oil pan to get filtered out at the oil filter and then back down here down this way. Now that oil galley is then going to come this way to feed the engine head through this head bolt hole here. Now splitting off that we've got another oil galley that's going to come down this way to feed the middle two ports over here. Now these ones are going to go ahead and lubricate the camshaft as well as the crankshaft bearings and that's why these inner bolts here were so sludged up. This hole is actually part of this oil galley that comes down and grabs oil from this one here. Now one flaw of the LS engine's oil lubrication system that a lot of people don't like is that it prioritizes oil flow to the head first before going down this way to lubricate the main bearing. Now some aftermarket blocks will actually correct that by prioritizing the main bearings for the crankshaft and camshaft first before directing oil to the heads for lubrication. Now taking a look at the top of this LS block if you look inside of here you can see where the lifters are and that's what's going to push this rod up and down. Now if we take a look at the camshaft which would sit inside the V of this engine we've got our five main bearing surfaces here. Now because this engine's got two valves per cylinder one intake and one exhaust we've got two low that feed each cylinder but there's eight cylinders and that's why you have 16 cam lobes on here. Now if you take a look at how these cam lobes are timed you can see that the first one and the third one here are going to correspond to this cylinder for intake and exhaust and the second one and fourth one are going to correspond to the cylinder at the back there. Now one of the most common upgrades on an LS engine is to do a cam swap and that's going to allow you to swap out this camshaft for one that has a higher low profile. That's going to push on these rods a little bit more to allow the valves to open up and allow more airflow. You can also play with the duration as well as the timing of them by changing the shape of this cam lobe. Now what makes it even easier is that the cam swap on these isn't too difficult. Once you remove the the timing cover and all the accessories from the engine the camshaft just pulls right out. Now another good thing is that the LS engine uses a timing chain with these nice sturdy gears and this chain here that doesn't have a hydraulic tensioner that could fail. Now here's a look at the piston for the LS engine. It's so sludged up that it actually kind of sticks when it goes to full swing here. I kind of have to push it extra just to free it up. Now the connecting rods on these LS engines are actually a sintered powder metal design which means that they've actually sintered this as one piece and then they've purposely cracked it at these points here to form the connecting rod caps and that's why these edges here are so rough they're not machine finished. Now the reason they've done that is so that when you install them together the crack inside of there is going to lock with each other to prevent any extra deformation and it just helps to keep it together. Now of course the aftermarket's done a lot with pistons on the LS engine so you can get pistons that have a different different top design here or forged bottom end. 
Now if we take a look at the LS Motors cooling system, you've got this big chunky water pump housing over here. Now the outlet of the water pump has these inlets and outlets that correspond to the two ports on the front of the block here. Now coolant is going to flow in through here and then up into the head where it's going to circulate and cool that off. It'll also circulate through these coolant jackets that are around each piston. Now it's interesting to note that this motor is actually a semi-closed design, which means that you've got some parts here that are reinforcing the piston to make it nice and strong, but you still allow a little bit of coolant to go in between here to cool things up. Now in lesser powered aluminum engines for example this might be a completely open deck design where you have a full circle going around the piston here with nothing supporting it. Also the advantage of going with an aluminum block is that you can run your temperatures a little bit lower on this motor so you can get a little bit more power out of it because aluminum is just a much better conductor of heat. Next we're going to take a look at the LS engine's head. Now we do have a multi-layer steel here for the head gasket. Now taking a look at the cylinder head we've got two valves per cylinder one intake and one exhaust with the spark plug slightly off center here. We've got this bowl shape here and that's what's going to form your compression ratio because the top of this piston is completely flat. The valves also can extend past this surface here because it'll contact the piston. Now despite only having two valves per cylinder whereas other vehicles might have four or five valves per cylinder this LS head actually does pretty good with airflow and that's one reason why these engines have so much potential for power. Now taking a look at the top half of this head here you can see that its overall profile is actually pretty skinny and that's because the intake and exhaust exhaust valves overlap each other as opposed to being on the intake and exhaust side exclusively. Now how the rocker arms work is you've got this push rod that's going to be moving up and down against the profile of the camshaft. Got this little ball on the end here that's just going to sit inside of here and that's what's going to continuously push this rocker up and down as it rides that camshaft. Now as this rocker arm is going up and down it's going to be pressing in and out on this valve to open and close it accordingly. Now also lending to its profile is that you don't have a spark plug up at the top here it's off to the side at this weird position. Now that's kind of good because changing these are externally accessed as long as you can get through the exhaust manifold here and you wouldn't have to worry about oil leaking through your spark plugs if you had bad spark plug tube seals and it was located at the top here. Now looking under the head here you can see that the semi-closed design kind of continues the theme here where you have coolant that's going to flow in these jackets all the way around each of the head to cool things off. Now taking a look under this really crusty valve cover here because there's so much sludge built up in this channel here that's supposed to vent out to the PCV valve. The PCV valve can't really do its job to ventilate the engine and then you start blowing out bottom end seals. And next we'll come to the air intake and on this guy it's actually made of just plastic. You've also got a plastic fuel rail which I don't really like. Now because this is a port injected engine only you've got your four fuel injectors on this side and then another four on the other fuel rail on the other side. Now up at the front here we do have a drive-by wire throttle body as well as a bunch of hoses and connections for your emission systems. Now of course because this is a GM you do you have your air intake manifold leaks which are pretty common Now you will have to remove this air intake manifold and pretty much everything attached to it in order to change these gaskets out. Now GM did make upgrades to the small box Chevy engine now called the LT engine they do have things like variable cam timing you have a direct injection and you've got cylinder deactivation now just like Honda they've also had issues with the variable cylinder management system causing problems with this engine. Now the good thing about the LS motor is that GM's chosen to put this in many different vehicles so you have a pretty good pick if you're looking for one to build or to swap into another vehicle. They put this in the GM Silverado trucks, the Tahoe SUVs, even the front wheel drive Impala and Grand Prix, not to mention the Camaro as well as the Corvette. Now not only are they cheap but they're actually reliable engines. You can get a lot of good mileage out of these even while pushing this engine well past the stock horsepower rating. And that's pretty much a good look at the GM LS engine. I think GM's done a pretty good job at making a reliable old school engine and the aftermarket has really come through to support this engine in many different builds. Now just make sure you keep up on your oil changes if you don't want this crap building up in your engine. Now make sure you follow me on Instagram for more behind the scenes footage and subscribe for more videos just like this one.